Well, Mark, you sat down with Vince Cerf, who co-designed the architecture of the internet and now has a place in the Internet Hall of Fame. Now, he got Cerf's thoughts on the path the internet has taken. And Mark began by asking him about the importance of hitting this milestone of half the world's population being online. It's kind of disappointing to think that we turned the internet on in January of 1983 and it's taken 35 years just to get halfway through the world's population. I'm hoping that we will see some accelerating uh, effects. Thank, uh, thankfully, the um, Wi-Fi systems and mobile telephony and mobile devices have accelerated the rate of access for a significant part of the world. It's been decades since its inception. Uh, what do you see as the fundamental difficulty the internet is now running into? Well, first of all, just getting it uh, accessible has been a challenge because as we penetrate into places where there's less disposable income, we have to drive costs out of the system. So getting the infrastructure to be less and less expensive is important. And then we have to try to maintain the uh, other important uh, celebratory point of today, and that's the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the question that this conference is addressing is how do we instantiate those rights in the digital world so that when we do get online, we feel that those rights are still preserved. And so that's sort of the overarching fundamental challenge that we face today. And one of those challenges is uh, the balance between being open and also protecting your rights. Many companies that offer online services are confronted with those challenges. The openness is incredibly valuable. In fact, without that openness, the indexing of the World Wide Web wouldn't be very useful. And so it's the freedom to not only inject information into the net, but find it and make use of it that's very important. The challenge that we face, though, is that these are neutral technologies. It's a platform. You can put anything that you want to on that platform. Some of that information may be misleading, could be deliberately harmful. Uh, on top of which, we also have problems like malware, where people distribute software or they launch denial of service attacks. So when people go online, they're looking for reliability, they're looking for safety, they're looking for security, they're look looking for privacy. It's also a question of policy. It may be a question of national policy. It may be a question of international agreements about how we protect people's rights in the online environment. Some of the harms that can occur can happen, it can be triggered in one jurisdiction, but the victim can be in another. So already you can see that there may have to be uh, multilateral and multi-stakeholder discussions. Different parts of the world, China, the US, Europe, they all have such differing views on how to regulate or control uh, what their population, what companies, uh, what they do on the internet. Could you possibly see them all coming together to agree on a certain set of principles? There is no absolute likelihood that everyone would adopt exactly the same policies. What we should be looking for, though, are policies that are compatible in some way across international boundaries. What that might mean is that there will be at least some agreement, I hope, on a multinational basis for rights in the online world that we would agree to enforce. What that means is that multiple countries will agree to, um, to uh, cooperate in order to protect people from harm in online environments. The Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, what new set of challenges do these technologies bring to the table? I keep thinking of uh, IoT as a, as a can labeled worms. Um, yes, they open up all kinds of potential hazards. So think about this for a moment. IoT means Internet of Things. Devices that are programmable, that uh, can be attached to the Internet, can interact with other devices on the net. Um, we now, and we give those devices a certain amount of autonomy to manage the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, to uh, handle security, to uh, maybe make our ovens and our refrigerators and other appliances smarter, or even drive the car for us. So we turn a lot of autonomy over to the software. The worry I have as a former programmer is that the software might not work exactly as it's supposed to. It might have a bug. And we don't know necessarily what kinds of harms could occur or hazards could occur with the bugs, but in some cases it could be serious, like a self-driving car that runs into something. 
uh, or a heating and ventilation system that fails to uh, keep the house cool or the refrigerator that melts your ice cream. The point here is that we are introducing a great deal of software whose functionality might be a little brittle. The artificial intelligence world just adds on yet another layer of potential hazard. Sometimes they don't work the way we expect them to.